I want to welcome you to one of the most interesting studies you'll probably ever have in your Christian life and ministry for you that are ministers. We're going to be looking at the lives of individuals that God chose to use throughout the centuries to lead his purposes in the earth. It'll be some of the most interesting stories about uh, how they overcome the triumphs, overcome and triumph over the obstacles of life, how they overcame their family troubles, how their financial woes disappeared and God gave them the breakthrough they needed. And we're entering into a time right now in the church world where this same element of waiting for the next group of leaders to come on the scene has come. We're coming to an end when the great ones that have led the last 20, 30 years have come to the end of their life. And they themselves are also saying they're looking for young men and young women to impart to, to talk to, and to give the wisdom of what they learned throughout their years to them. And I think the whole church world is looking, who's going to be the next group of leaders? Are they going to make it? We've had in the last so many years, say like the last 15 years, some great troubles with some of our leaders who didn't quite make it all the way with personal challenges and so forth. And there's a question in the church world that the next leaders as they come, will they be able to make it to the end of their life successfully and leave this earth with honor and respect and admiration even from secular society? In this study, we're going to look at the lives of people. We're going to look at them in this way. We're going to look at them, what they did that was right and what they did that was not right. We have what we call constructive criticism as we go through history to find out how we could skip over and jump over the ditches of personal failure and ministerial failure. And when we begin to do that, a lot of times people say, well, you shouldn't talk about the negative. Well, I believe we should discuss those things from a, from a standpoint of understanding why they did what they did so you and I don't have to do it either. So many times people think, well, I'll never do that, and they're always the ones that end up making the same mistake again and again. You'll notice as I go through these uh, lives of these individuals that they keep repeating the same problems over and over and over. And one of my heart desires are, uh, is to get people to understand they don't have to go through these things. You can learn by reading the scriptures and you can learn by seeing who has gone before you. Like Paul said, he said, I, these things are written in the Old Testament that we might learn from them as examples so we can hit the right thing and skip the wrong thing. The first person we're going to look at today is a man that probably not many of you have heard of. The reason why you have not heard of him is because he died with a lot of controversy around his name. He died with beliefs that were not true, and he died with doctrinal errors that totally made those who did love him not want to talk about him or discuss him. His name is John Alexander Dowie. He was a man that God used in a time period of 1847 in Scotland. He's a Scottishman. And uh, years before his life, there was another man by the name of John Knox who came through there and really revolutionized the whole Christian realm of Scotland. Well, Dow is going to do the same thing for the whole world in relationship to the ministry of salvation and healing. At the age of six, he had decided that he would never drink or smoke, and he began to read his Bible through with the help of his parents. And then when he was a young man in the young teenage years, his family decided to leave Scotland and go to Australia, where it took six months on a boat to float that far from, uh, uh, from Scotland all the way to Australia, six months on one of those ocean liners to get there. And when he got to Australia, he began to work with his family's business, and they began to find that he had the ability to make money very quickly and rapidly, and business skills was almost unnatural to him. And then he decided that at a certain age, he had saved his money, he wanted to go back to Scotland and to study at the University of Edinburgh. So he floated back probably six months back from Australia to Scotland to go to the university. And while he was there, he decided to take two subjects. He would major in political science, and then he would also minor in theological studies. Now, to me, this is the first sign of a developing apostolic call that's on his life. See, in the apostolic ministry, you have two things that begin to function here. You have the apostolic ministry has a very strong governmental feeling to it, very strong order and fashion and dictatorial type of methodology to set things in order and keep things straight. And so we see that with the political desire he went after, and you also see the ministerial call with the desire to go into the theological studies. And they called him not so much a great student because he was one that always would raise his hand and ask questions to the teacher and have an argument from the teacher to the student back and forth where even the other students would probably think, here he goes again. But he was so good at what he was doing, and he was so good in the theological realm, they asked him to be the chaplain for the infirmary of the school. So that gave him a very interesting opportunity. 
He was a man that had the opportunity to sit in the discussions and the lectures of the medical school. So I know in those days they may be doing an autopsy and the, the medical teachers that have the body, they were doing the autopsy on, in, in the middle of the room and the seating kind of was escalated up in a circular fashion. And he was able to sit there in the classroom and hear them discuss about the autopsy or the surgery they might be doing. And he discovered that the doctors and the professors there did not know all that they were doing. It was more trial and error. He called it an inexact science. And this began to form a certain belief in him that people that were in the medical world and going to doctors for medical treatment should be aware that they were mainly just being people they were being practiced on. So that began to form a doctrine that would come out in his healing ministry that when you sought God for healing, that you do not go to doctors, you don't take the medicine, you throw it all away. Now in today's world where medical science is a little bit more uh, exact and a whole lot more helpful to human beings, I wouldn't think he would hold to the same opinion. But this also began the doctrine in the early Pentecostal church that if you're going to believe God for healing, you, you don't need medicine, you don't go to doctors, you just trust God and pray, and either you get healed or you die. And it came from this uh, experience that Dowie had that he saw these people doing these things, the surgeries and autopsies, and realizing that they were not going to have uh, be any better after it was over. So he began to preach, if you want healing, don't go to the doctors. They'll kill you. They'll get you worse off. And so during this whole time period, I believe God was forming certain things. His view on the healing ministry was being formed, even probably beyond his own men mindset of what was happening. Dr. Dowie decided because he got a, a telegram from Australia, they had to quit the university and go back to Australia early because of some family situations. When he went back to Australia, he decided that he would start pastoring, so he had his first church. And he wanted to continue his studies during this particular time. But as he was pastoring this first church, he found that this church was not something he wanted to deal with very long. He found that the denomination he was a part of was very controlling, that they did not like creativity, which is a typical aspect of a religious situation. They do not want you to be creative and not break out of the little shell of the box they put you in. But when you obey the Lord and you follow the Holy Spirit, you're always going to have a bigger world than what religious, religious denominations give you and religious mindsets give you. And so he resigned his first passion because he felt like they were boxing him in and that the congregation was lethargic. Now, this is a man that was a self-motivator. He was not one that had to be told what to do. He got up and he did it. He did not need a lot of encouragement. He didn't need a lot of people to say, you're great, keep going. He didn't have a lot of bouts with depression or not knowing what to do. His problem was he kept finding borders of limitation that society, religion, church members, and family kept putting on him, and he kept wanting to break out of it, which I think is one of the characteristics of a great leader, that you always keep forging ahead the borders of Christianity. If we'd have more leaders like that, then salvation would be brought a whole lot faster to the world. Healing would be a whole lot faster to them that are sick. And the church would be a whole lot more further down the road instead of sometimes 20 to 30 years behind what even secular society is doing. We need more people like Dowie in his self-motivation. And so he resigned from, um, from this first church and went on to do some other things and was given another church. And during this time, he met his wife. Now, whom he married is a little interesting story that I think would be a little trivia for you in, in the historical aspect that he married his cousin. His father-in-law was a little upset about, first off, them being family like they were to uh, discuss uh, them being married because he didn't think it was right. So Dowie, being articulate as he was with speech, he began to write letters and talk about it, that there was people in the Bible who had done this and there was no wrong in this and no sin in this. And finally, the father all agreed, all right, you can get married. But the father-in-law had another challenge and another concern that he told both Dowie and his wife, Jeannie, that he felt like Dowie was such a man that could not stay in one job or occupation very long that he was scared that he could not provide for his daughter the way that he should. And to be honest, that's what actually happened. They got married finally, and soon after their marriage, he was going through financial difficulties to the point that his daughter or his wife had to go back to his father-in-law's house and stay there for a while. And even to the point that there was some trouble between his wife and him. But he made this great statement that I think would be interesting for you to know. He said, I can see the future and what I'm supposed to do better than I can resolve the present problems of, the, of today. So which to me is the problem of a visionary. A visionary can see how to take care of all the problems of the future, how to push back the borders of ministry and Christendom, but at the same time, they do not know how to handle 
the present problems right in front of them. How to get enough money to buy food for the table. How to keep that family in harmony. How to make the present day needs of the ministry, the present day needs of their business to go forward. And so many times that's why so many visionaries are not successful. They don't understand what's going on because they do not understand how to take care of the present problems. And that is something they must decide to do with a human will conscious. They're so used to flowing with the creative energies, they're so used to flowing with the anointing and the visionary that God has given them, but they have to realize some things, they have to volunteer their will and go do some discovery on their own of how to solve the present problem. In 1876, Dow faced one of his biggest problems but would lead to one of his greatest discoveries and lead him to world fame. In the little church that he was pastoring, there came a plague over Australia that began to cause people to die. He buried over 40 of his church members during this particular time. And what happened to his heart as a pastor when he began to officiate 40 funerals of children, mothers, and fathers, and even to some of the other churches who the pastors had passed away to, he went over and officiated the sermons of other churches, he began to cry out to God. God, you've got to heal today. There's something more you've got to do to help these people. A shepherd's heart, a pastor's heart, went out and began to cry out to God on behalf of the people. And while he's going through this soul searching and going through this, this pressing into God, he discovers and God sends him Acts 10.38 as a revelation. And Acts 10.38 says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with the power to go about doing good and all that were oppressed of the devil. He discovered two things. Number one, that all sickness and oppression came from the devil and that God was not the author of it. And when that revelation hit his spirit and he began to understand it, almost immediately he said there was a knock at the door of the parsonage where he was at when this revelation came to him. And it was from some friends that was down the road saying, Pastor Dowie, come quickly, Mary is going to die. One of the other young ladies in his church had lived a few blocks down with her parents and was on her deathbed. The doctor told the, the people there to go get the pastor so he can come and comfort the family and pray for the little girl as she dies. So he ran out the, of his house down the street a few houses to the place where Mary was living came into the house, he said, and the doctor met him and said, well, you just got to prepare the family. She's going to pass away in a few hours. There's nothing we can do. Death is going to happen. And Dowie turned to the mother and said, why did you send for me? She said, well, I was hoping that maybe you could do something. He said, well, I can do something. I believe God can do something now. Well, the doctor told Dr. Dowie, well, no, no, don't, don't do that. The girl is going to die. Just comfort the family. Be this nice little pastoral man and make sure everything's pleasant and help them through their time of grief. And he so came back at the, uh, the pastor there, or the doctor, excuse me, that the doctor thought he was crazy and there was something wrong with him and he left the room kind of upset. So Dyer walked over to the bedside, laid his hands on Mary, the little, the little girl there in the home, and prayed for God to heal her. Let the, the ravaged disease die, he prayed for God of, uh, to come down and touch this little girl and make her whole. And when he finished the prayer, the, uh, the mother said, well, is she dead? And Dr. Dyer said, I don't think so, because when he got through praying, she was looking there like she'd lost all of her life, her pulse seemed to be gone, and all of a sudden her eyes opened and she asked for something to eat and to drink, and the little girl was healed. He goes to the bedroom next door where her sister and her brother was, prayed for them, and they are healed, and nobody else in his church dies of this disease during this whole time the plague is going on. And for the next few years as he passed, he only had like five funerals of elderly people who have fulfilled their natural time on earth and died. No one died of disease, no one died of tragedy, because the revelation that God is a healing and healing was for today had exploded inside of him. Now this began his big time display on the public scene of, of, of the world of the healing ministry. Dowie began to pray for the sick, and as he began to pray for the sick, people began to get healed. And like it was in the days of Jesus, when healing started happening and deliverance started happening, fame starts being spread about. People start talking about it. And all of a sudden, Dowie becomes the most famous pastor, faith healer, as you may want to call it, uh, in Australia. He is now preaching to crowds of up to 20,000 as his healing ministry begins to accelerate. He has a very strong gift, a very strong faith, and he also, here's something a little interesting about him, unless you are born again or are ready to repent, he won't pray for you. He believes that healing only belongs to the Christian. And so what he does, you come up on the platform and he'll talk to you for a few moments, and if he'll ask you a question or if he discerns that you're not saved and you don't want to get saved, then he won't pray for you because he believes that healing only belongs to the Christians. Now, I thank God. We've gone a little bit further than that and known that God's love is that he loves a sinner as well as the Christian, and will heal both of them. They'll come to him in faith. 
But during this time, Dowie has an unusual ability to get pulled out of the will of God. And this is something he'll go throughout his entire life. And here's a lesson that we can learn. When God has placed you in a, in a certain calling, a certain office, and a certain ability he's given you by his, by his mercy and grace, don't leave it. Stay where God puts you. Don't come out of your calling. Stay where God puts you. He was so famous and carried such a command uh, about his ministry that the temperance movement wanted him to be their candidate to have a seat in the Australian Parliament. At first, when they approached him, he said, no, um, I don't want to do it. I'm going to stay with the healing ministry. I want to stay pastoring and speaking God's word to the people. They came back a second time. And finally, he said, all right, I'll do it. So he began to go around the country and preach about the social ills of drinking and morality and all of these different situations that were going bad in Australia and how God was the answer and that he would be one of the, one of the people's spokespersons to send up for righteous in the parliament. And he lost. Well, when he lost us in the Australian parliament, I think his ego was a little bit bruised. I think uh, Dr. Dowie had a very big ego. I think men of this time period doing what he was doing, he kind of thought he was the only guy doing it. And I would say this for, it, for him on this point, plus he was probably the only guy with that much popularity and that big of a crowd draw probably in the world at this time for the ministry of healing. But he decided after a while, he pastored there, had huge crowds, lost in the Australian uh, election. He was in debt, had to come out of debt, but he thought it's time to go around the world and do a world trip. So he decided that he would leave Australia and head for America first and go through San Francisco. And so he got on the boat with his wife and his family and headed for America. Now this would be one of the greatest things that ever happened in his life when he moved from Australia to America. But his first intention was just to tour the world and preach the message of healing and salvation and pray for the sick. When he got to San Francisco, the newspapers were talking about the Australian faith healers come to America, and so he'd already begin to gain popularity in America, and people begin to come to his hotel room where he was staying, and one report said that the people lined up down the hallway uh, waiting for Dowie to pray for him, and again, he brought them in one by one into his suite where he was at, and he would talk to them, and if they didn't, he didn't feel like they were Christians, he wouldn't pray for them. And so finally he went through several people he wouldn't pray for, and pretty soon the newspapers began to talk about oh, nobody's getting healed. And finally he found a woman that had a growth in her neck that uh, was a believer, that was a tr sincere person that believed in God, he felt, and he laid hands on her and prayed for her, and the, the big growth of the knot on her neck went down, and that was one of the first miracles he had. Well, of course, the newspapers talked about it. It began to be noise abroad, and pretty soon he began to be invited to different things throughout the West Coast. But at the same time, another interesting thing was happening here. The woman by the name of Maria Woodworth Edder is holding one of her meetings in Oakland, California, just across the bay from San Francisco. She is having one of the worst meetings of her life in the sense of all the persecution and opposition. But he heard that this little woman believed in healing too. So he goes over to her tent meetings and sits there and meets her, even gets on the platform and speaks highly of her and talks about uh, how great she is and how God is using the ministry of healing and makes you know, positive remarks. But something interesting happens in Maria Woodworth at her meetings, and we'll be talking about that in the next uh, teaching here. But let me give you a little bit of a glimpse into her life so you'll understand about what's about to happen. In her meetings, besides healing, people would go out under the powers we call today being slain in the spirit, and uh, people would go into trances, and they would stand like statues for 30 minutes, an hour or something. They would see heaven or they would see hell or some type of angelic or some type of thing that God wanted to communicate to them that he didn't understand. Now, Dowie's ministry mainly consisted of two things. He preached salvation. He preached, number two, healing. He didn't have a lot of demonstrative type of manifestations. He thought it was emotional, fanaticism. And eventually, Dowie turned on Mother Edder and called it trans evangelism and said that it was something of the devil and was the worst deception he had seen in quite some time in his life, if not in his entire life. So the, the two met, became friends for a, a season. Then they split and became bitter enemies until the end of his life. She and Mr. Dowie never were able to come back into a friendship. Now this brings, I think, one of the great mistakes of Dowie's life. Number one, I believe God arranged for Mother Edder and Dr. Dowie to meet. There are very few people in his life and at this time that had the spiritual seniority, a spiritual maturity that were able to talk to Dowie as a man of God and understand the weaknesses of human nature and the strengths of the anointing. Most people stood in awe of Dowie not knowing how to say no. There were only yes men as we would call them today. Whatever he said was fine. What he wanted to do was fine. They were scared of his of the aura about him, I guess you could say it that way. But Mother Edder was the one that was mature enough, understood the message of healing, understood the anointing, understood the whole aspect of ministry and life. 
to the point where she could look at Dowie and say, that's not right, that's a problem, this needs a change, that's not quite in order as it's supposed to be according to scripture. But I believe the devil stepped in there and aborted a divine relationship. And let me encourage you here, many of you, God will arrange for you to meet people in your life. And these divine relationships are very few throughout your life, and they are the hardest ones to hold on to and to hold fast to throughout your life. The devil will work more in, in trying to abort and to annihilate and to destroy a divine relationship. A divine relationship, number one, is, does not focus on the natural sides of life as its first priority. It focuses upon what the spiritual thing, growth, the principles of, of what you're learning in the spirit, impartation, keeping check and balances, uh, encouraging when you're down, praying for you, discussing the deeper things of God. It is a divine relationship. And many times people have assumed their practical relationships, people that have said, well, this is my golfing buddy, or this is who I go shopping with, or this is who I vacation with, this family and my family vacation together. Well, those are all good and they're all fine, but they're not always a divine relationship. Sometimes a divine relationship will just be the spiritual matters and all the other natural side will not be something that you would enjoy doing with that same person. Sometimes it might be, and if it is something you enjoy doing with them in the natural, you have to make sure that does not take the leadership or the dominance in that relationship. How many times have people met the right person that God put into life, but for whatever reason the devil aborted it or they got it out of order and it began to cause great trouble and later in life they suffer for it. When a divine relationship is aborted, there's always suffering, especially on the, the one younger's part to the senior one. There's always a suffering to it. Dowie was the younger. Mother Edda was the senior. She was like the mother Israel kind of uh, person in this time period. And the devil worked overtime to abort this relationship. Well, Dowie continued preaching throughout the West Coast, and finally he decided he would move on into the Midwest and went to the second largest city in America at this time called Chicago. At the same time he went to Chicago, it was the same year that the World's Fair was occurring there. So he decided what better place to preach the message of salvation healing than right outside the front door of the World's Fair. So he built what was called the little wooden hut. He got this little building, constructed it, and began to hold daily meetings and evening meetings there. And at first, no one paid much attention to it. Who wants to go to church and hear a preacher when the World's Fair is only 15 feet from the door of the church with all the rides, the latest inventions, all the world stuff is there, all your friends there. You want to go see the fair. But as the time keeps passing pretty soon, the noise about healings and deliverances begin to be a main topic of discussion throughout this whole time period of the World's Fair. So people will begin to come to his church and sit there and wait to see the miracles. Chicago was a very interesting city. It was a spiritual hub environment for this time period. Chicago became the city of, of the leading spiritual activities. In this city, you have Dowie as the spiritual mayor. You have D.L. Moody across town as the world evangelist. And the two didn't get along because, you know, Moody was a salvation preacher, which is tremendous to be, but that's the only thing he preached. Dowie was salvation and healing. He also worked apostolically where D.L. Moody was mainly just evangelistic. And so the two had a few conflicts throughout the time period of living there and never really joined or never really had much of a friendship. But Dowie was the spiritual mayor of Chicago. It's like there's a natural mayor. I believe there are spiritual mayors uh, uh, for cities around the world. And so Dowie was there. So he moved into the city and decided this is where he was going to set up his world headquarters. He had decided to go around the world. He said, but Chicago is where God wants me to be. Chicago is where God wants me to establish my headquarters. So he began what they call the healing homes. Now, in today's Christianity, we don't know much about that. We have healing services. We have miracle rallies. But he had what he called healing homes. Now, what they were was homes that he had bought that was probably several stories high with rooms in them where the sick could come. Now, for you to come in and take up one of the rooms in Dowie's healing homes would be you have to leave all the medication, all the doctor's instructions outside. He did not allow any medicine or you could not follow any of the doctor's instructions because you come trusting God alone. And so when you came in there, they gave you a room, and what they did, they sent one of the spiritual nurses by, as you could call them, that would pray for you, read the scriptures to you. And if you could be moved, they would take you to the special services and the chapels in the home, as well as in the church that he also had started. Well, of course, the people in, in the city there was one that did not like the healing ministry. They did not like what he stood for. They didn't like his personality. But at the same time, he was a man that began to say, well, I don't care what you like or not. When you govern a city, 
that city, you cannot obey. They start to obey you. You've got to buck four major power systems. You've got to buck the media system, you've got to buck the financial system, the political system, and the religious belief system, which he began to do as a spiritual mayor. He built a church that began to become one of the main churches, if not the main church, and it grew into thousands. So what we have here that we have found in my hunting and researching is a, a little wax recording we found from the early 1900s of the people there singing uh, in the services. <laughs> The city of Chicago did not at first like Dr. Daly. They arrested him a hundred times in one year for practicing medicine without a license. That was one way they thought they could wear him down and push him out of Chicago and get this false preacher, this faith healer out of business and out of their community. But when you're under an apostolic anointing, the more pressure you're under, the more you come alive. So the more they fought him and the more they came against him in the papers and arrested him, they thought they keep arresting him after church, before church, and do, when he come out of his house for practicing without a license, that they would actually wear him down and he just paid the $5 fine and leave. But he didn't, so he took it all the way to court. He kept fighting it and fighting it until he took it to the court. Now, the brilliance of Dow is something that we should look at here. The man was a genius. He was not just a, an articulate, anointed person, but he had a mind that was sharp. He hired a lawyer to tell him what the law book said, but he represented himself and spoke for himself because he knew the lawyer could not represent him correctly. So for over a hundred times in one year, they arrested him, finally he won the case. And this is one of the first cases in American history where he began to change the law where you and I can lay hands on sick people in the name of Jesus and pray for them and not be arrested for practicing medicine without a license. He was one of the first men in American history to begin to break that law and change it to where we can be free to practice the prayer of healing for the sick and not be in trouble with the natural laws of the land. Now, Dowie also had begun a magazine called The Leaves of Healing. He published it weekly and sent it out to all of his friends and partners and people that wanted to be on the mental list all over America and around the world. So the second attack came to him from the, from the Chicago Postmaster. They wanted to remove his nonprofit mailing status. So he fought it in the Chicago courts and lost. He went all the way he could to the highest court there in Chicago. And finally, he could not win. So he said, well, I'm going to go to Washington, D.C., and I'm going to talk to the Postmaster General and head of all the post offices in America. So he went out to Washington, D.C. to talk with them and tell them what was going on, lay his case before them, which he won. But here's what happened. While there, President McKinley heard that Dowie was in Washington and decided that he wanted to meet him. And so the president came out of a cabinet meeting to meet this healing minister in Chicago who had become noted for the great miracles as well as the great controversies. If you're going to go into the ministry of healing, you have to be willing to have great glory and great persecution. They go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. They go together. And so while Dowie was speaking with President McKinley, he began to observe and felt in his spirit that there was uh, danger around the president and felt like his security was not tight enough and even spoke to his church when he came back. Let's pray for the president because I feel like there is going to be an attempt on his life and the security is so relaxed that it may be successful. Well, as we all know, President McKinley was shot and uh, what Dowie perceived and what Dowie talked about was uh, actually came to pass and he felt that in his heart. I, I think many times 
men of the Spirit can pick up things even with those who don't know anything about God, and God puts them in places to warn them like he did the president. But sometimes if the men listening does not obey or take heed to it, then, my friend, uh, tragedy comes to them. The same is true with a lot of people uh, when God's trying to share something with them and God's trying to warn them through Scripture or through uh, a person of credible reputation saying, don't do this or be aware of this, and they don't listen. Then at that point in time, God says, well, you've decided not to listen to me. You just go ahead and do what you think is right, and when you come back to me, I'll help you recover from all the mess that you're in. So I guess the president got into a little bit of a mess and lost his life. Uh, at this particular time in Chicago, the city of Chicago began to realize they cannot get rid of Dowie. And history tells us that every person that came against Dr. Dowie uh, either died, was imprisoned, or moved out of the city in a matter of a few months after they began to oppose him. He became the governor of the city. Even the political people running for uh, offices in the council and in the, in the mayor's office wanted to cater and get Dowie's approval because whoever he approved would win. He carried that kind of weight and influence. He was reading one day in a newspaper about a young man that was on death row and they were going to uh, execute him for the crimes he committed. And he read what the man said. He said, I never had a chance uh, to get my, my life in order. His parents were criminals and, and people that were always in doing the bad things and in and out of jail. And so the child grew up only knowing that. And so when actually he committed the crime that caused his execution, his last words was, I never had a chance. No one taught me anything different. That so moved the heart of uh, Dr. Downey. He said, well, that will never happen again in my city. I love how he said, my city. Uh, there's something about a governing ship that you have been placed in your heart that the apostolic gifts have, that this is his city, his people. They pastor everybody in the town. So he created a group called the 70s, and what they were were people that he had trained and taught how to minister, and their job was to go to every home uh, in the city and pray for them, give them one of his magazines about leaves of hitting, tell them how to get saved, and do their best to bring them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And during the life of Dowie, everybody who lived in that city at the time that he began to minister with the 70s throughout the city had somebody from his church come and knock on their door and speak to them and talk to them and pray for them and try to bring them to salvation. I hope that people listening to me will have the same type of burden. It's not an impossible feat for people to organize people who love Jesus and say we're going to go out and minister to the people. The problem has been in our church world today is we live inside of the four walls and we critique the pastor, we critique the song leader, we critique this person and that person and what we become is spectators and not participants. I sometimes use the illustration of a big football game and the fans are up there in the, in, in the, in the seats and the stands and they're saying, do this and, and do that and they're yelling at the player. But there's a big difference between the person in the stands and the person down on the field. The person on the field has all those guys running to push them on the ground and lay on top of them and grab the ball from them. Uh, they're a little bit different viewpoint when you're down there in the real, in the real battle. And so many times if people do not keep being active and doing the ministry, they become a religious critic. And so many people have to be careful that they begin to do the ministry and not criticize those who are doing it. Because when you're doing it, you're so glad somebody else is doing it as well. Dow was about to start one of the biggest mistakes of his life. On the New Year's Eve service of 1899, as he went into the 1900s, he had two big, huge pictures that was covered by canvas on the platform of his auditorium. His church was packed out for that New Year's Eve service. And he announced that night that he was going to build a city. He's going to call the city named Zion. He had gone up to 40 miles north of Chicago and had bought 6,600 acres of land. And this is going to be a city that he was going to build for the righteous. There will be the people that could come and be free from all the worldly uh, spirits and all the worldly pulls, and there'd be no vexation of the Christian soul, and it'd be a Christian utopia, as we may call it today. It in history is the longest surviving utopia ever known in the history of man. But as we all know, the Bible did not say, go build me a city. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He made two major mistakes here as he began this. Number one, he left the city where God put him called Chicago, Illinois. He also began to go from the healing ministry back into business. Because when you build a city, you've got to be all the business required. He became the mayor. He became the banker, the editor of the newspaper. He helped head up the schools. He was the only pastor in church in town. He was everything in this particular city. Now, when I first make these statements, you may think, well, that is not quite going to make it. The first year of Zion had only had 5,000 citizens in it. The second year of Zion had over 10,000 citizens living in this city. It was a major accomplishment. Even the people that was his persecutors in Chicago began to admire this man and what he could pull off. 
Even Teddy Roosevelt came and spent a few days in Dowie, with Dowie, in his home there in Zion, Illinois. He is popular. He was the world's most famous faith healer. He carried the mantle for that particular generation, and he built a city called Zion. The streets are called Hallelujah Boulevard, Elijah Street, all the different types of biblical names that are still there today. The city of Zion is still operating. It's not under the same type of government as when Dow was alive, but the streets are the same, and some of the buildings are still there. I was there a few years ago and saw it, and it's kind of uh, takes your mind back a little bit to think that just uh, in the early 1900s, men built a city with over 10,000 people in it, and he controlled everything. And there would be billboards up and down the street. If you don't like certain things, you can go someplace else. So he was not at all bashful about telling you this is the city, this is the way we run it. If you don't like it, go back to Chicago or go someplace else. Now, the people in this city came from all over the world, all over America, different countries of the world, to be in a city where God was in total control, where the people of God was in charge. For example, when there would be a, a whistle blow or the church bells would ring, and the whole city of Zion would stop for a moment of silent prayer. Can you imagine when you'd hear the whistle blow and the church bell rings, that everybody on the street corner, the, the shop clerks in the stores, people in the business would stop, kneel, or stand there in silent prayer for so many moments, and then everybody go back about their business. That's how they govern the city. Now, people say, well, I'd like that. Well, I'd hope you would, but the same way, God did not call us to live in a little world where we're outside of the world. We're called to be witnesses to the world, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So Dowie made two fundamental mistakes. He disobeyed the Great Commission by trying to build a world uh, that he can control and the devil wouldn't be there and the people would just stay there and wait for the coming of the Lord. And the second thing is he left the city of Chicago where God had called him to be the spiritual mayor and governor. But the city began to grow. They began to have, you know, the big hotel began to go up. The church at City Thousand went up. The lace factories went up. He got the railroad to bring the, their own track up from Chicago so they could go back and forth on the railroad. Had all these things begin to happen. Well, at the same time, Dowie began to go through some other challenges. Before I get there, what I like to do, though, is go for a few moments and talk just about his healing ministry, some people that were healed in his ministry. I think sometimes people that... Uh, uh, he prayed for it, we would be able to relate to in church history and world history. So let me give you a, a few of the stories. One of the people that was healed in Dr. Dowie's ministry was John G. Lake's family. We'll be studying him a little bit later in, later in this series. But Lake said in his life, he remembers a young child, hearses, caskets, nurses, and all the things that go around people dying. But when he met Dr. Dowie, he began to send telegrams to Dowie to pray for his relatives, to pray for his wife, and they began to get healed. And actually, Dow, uh, Lake's healing ministry began because people began to hear that Lake's family was getting healed, and they came to him to get prayer. So eventually, John G. Lake left the West Coast and came to live and became one of the elders in Dowie's church in Zion. Another person that was healed uh, in Dowie's ministry is Buffalo Bill's niece. Uh, he had a little run-in with Buffalo Bill during the World's Fair because he kept trying to have church in a little wooden hut, and Buffalo Bill kept having his guns go off and his Indians do their war cries and run through the world for air and hinder his service. So he felt like he had revenge when his niece, Bubba Bill's niece, came and was healed. Five doctors had told her she would never be able to live. She was in a body cast. He prayed for her and she got up and was healed. Abraham Lincoln's niece was also healed. She came. Doctors did not know what was wrong with her, but uh, he prayed for her. Dr. Dowie did. She got up and was healed. Another famous lady minister that was a medical doctor by the name of Lillian Yeomans was healed. She had become addicted to uh, certain medications, and her life was all uh, going down here physically because of her addiction. Went to Dr. Dowie's ministry. He prayed for her. The addiction broke, and she actually became a full gospel minister that we have some of her books around the day that we read. And then she was healed and delivered and brought into the healing ministry uh, through Dr. Dowie. We also have a few other little stories that I think you may find interesting that we pulled from our files of Dr. Dowie's life. We have uh, his janitor that he had take care of the facilities had been getting sick in his stomach area. He'd been taking medicine and, and that wouldn't work and kept going on. Finally, his wife uh, found Dr. Dow as he was walking through the church one day and asked Dr. Dow, would you pray for so-and-so, my husband, uh, because he has a, a digestive problem. And so Dr. Dow prayed for him. And uh, as soon as he finished praying, uh, the man uh, went to the restroom and, and this sounds kind of gross, but, but an 18-foot tapeworm came out of his insides. 
and uh, he was healed. And they actually put it in a jar, and you'll see it there on the screen. I thought that may be something you'll never forget or never have seen before, because I'd never seen or heard of that before. But Dowie also liked the ability to display uh, the discarded tr crutches and uh, canes and stretchers. And you'll see here in some of the other pictures of him up on a wall, and he'll spell out Christ all and all. And he'll put them all around this church as a great uh, testimony that uh, God is a healing God today. Dowie at the height of his ministry, began to make some fundamental mistakes, as I said a moment ago. He left Chicago where God put him. He moved to Zion, built a city where we have to admire him for what he did in establishing that city. But in doing so, he was more involved in business than the healing ministry, which was a consistent problem throughout his life. When he left the healing ministry, he went to financial trouble. He began to go into difficulty. But then he also began to go into some other problems. He declared himself Elijah, Elijah the Restorer. Then he also declared himself the first apostle of the Christian Catholic Church, which was a denomination that he was a part of. Then he began to dress up in his high priestly robe. He began to go off. His wife left him, uh, never divorced, but separated from him during this period of his life. Uh, Dr. Dye made some fundamental mistakes in the beginning. What were some of his mistakes that made him make these tragic errors to why today you don't know much about him? Probably today, this is the first time you're hearing about this great apostle of healing. The first time you ever knew this man existed and what he did. Over 150 ministers came out from his ministry into the early Pentecostal movement, like F.F. F. Bosworth was trained and came out of Dye. Raymond T. Ritchie, Gordon Lindsay's family moved to be a part of the Zion uh, uh, city there. Some of our great leaders of the early Pentecostal movement came forth out of Dowie. But why did he make his fundamental mistakes? Why did he think he was Elijah? Why do you think he was the first apostle? Why did he get involved in his high priestly uh, mindset? Why did he begin to have visions of grandeur? One of his problems was he actually wanted to build Zions all over the world, and he had plans prepared to buy Jerusalem back from the Turks and make that his headquarters of Zions and prepare the city for the coming of the Lord. Uh, the man just went not a little off, but way off. Now, that's why people don't want to talk much about him, but I think that's where we need to talk because people still make mistakes, maybe not on the same scale, but they make the same kind of mistakes. Here are some of the situations and principles we can learn from his life. Number one, Dowie had no counsel around him. All the people around about him were yes men and scared of him and afraid of his personality and his temperament and probably the power that he carried. The man that actually succeeded Dowie after Zion went through financial difficulties was Volvo, who was a man that began to teach that the world was fat when we had proven for hundreds of years that it was round. So to me, that says something. Why would you have a right-hand man who was teaching and believed that the world was flat when the world was actually around and proven scientifically that it was so? That's because you don't care about what they think. You just like the yes ability inside of them. Dr. Dowie never had the right counsel, lost his divine relationship with Mother Edder. Number two, he was a worker. He was a tireless worker. One man said in his writings about Dr. Dowie, knew him to work 46 hours nonstop with no sleep and keep on going. He had that ability, that, talking about self-motivation, he had that. But here's another great point. You cannot go beyond the mental and physical capacities uh, of your physical man. So many people get into the spirit and they can keep going because the spirit man does not grow weary like the mind and the body does. But if you don't take care of the mind and the body, it will affect your ministry and bring it to a close. Eventually, Dowie had a stroke. He was taken from the platform. They thought he could do better and recuperate better if he went to some warmer climate. So he went to Jamaica and tried to rest there and begin to gain some physical health back. But Zion, as I said, was in financial difficulties. So they voted him out of power and Volvo and the people around him came into power. Dowie, of course, went to courts and began to fuss and to fight and never again was able to actually have leadership of Zion. He died, as you'll see this picture, the last known picture, in a wheelchair on front of his front porch of his house. He died with his wife, not a part of his life. His son disowned him and became a minister of an evangelical denomination and only made one comment that I could find about him, that my father was a very sincere man but had a great ability to be highly deceived. Uh, Dr. Dye was a man that I think we should admire, that we should honor, but we should also learn from his mistakes. Many of you will be called of God to do great feats, but what kind of counsel do you have around about you? Are you going beyond your physical abilities and, and, and restraints? Are you changing offices at will? Are you leaving what is working to go do something that your soul wants to do? So many times people do that because their mind gets bored or they get tired of what they're doing. Stay where God called you. Stay where God put you, and don't leave until God tells you to. And if he don't tell you, stay right there.
there. He built a city and disobeyed the Great Commission. And taken all that money, he should have trained ministers and built churches all over America and all over the world and sent them people out to do the great works of the Great Commission. But he didn't do that. He got caught up in business. Sometimes his intelligence seemed to be his own problem too. He was so smart and so he thought he could do anything. But you can only do what God tells you to do. I don't care how rich you are, how smart you are, how intelligent you are. What I want to do here for a few moments, we've also found some recordings of him preaching and sharing at his church. So what I'd like to do for the next few moments is let you hear Dr. Dally. It comes from a wax cylinder. It's an old, it's kind of scratchy, so we'll put the word to this so you can hear him say, uh, hear him preach and hear him pray. But I want you to get a feel of one of the greatest men that we've studied in our series that I hope that you'll spend more time doing your own study on because he is one that paved the road that we now walk upon. The majority of men are a stinking bad lot. I am ashamed to say it. The majority of men in Chicago can be smelled several yards off. They think of nicotine and alcohol and all kinds of medical muck. Ah, you dirty dog, could chew your tobacco and pop your smoke. The sun dries it up. That's just the cabrar and cancer in your throat, which you expect to read on the street, in your offices, and in your home. The wind carries it up to our nostrils and into our lungs. And good women and some clean men have to breathe your disease breathing air. Ah, uh, you dare dog. You call yourself Christian? Uh, how can a man be a Christian whose throat is an open sepulchre and whose stomach is a dirty safety? Oh, you dirty dog! You throw nicotine and reap amorosis, paralysis, cancer and diseases of the stomach and bowel and transmission. You are worse than dogs. I apologize to the dogs, for they are far cleaner and better behaved than many men who are slaves to nicotine in the form of tobacco. The only principle of government laid down in the word of God is the government of the people by God and for God is the office. The kingdom of God must be established upon this earth. Right came to do it, and he will fulfill his task. This gospel was the gospel of what? Audience, the kingdom. Yes, the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God must prevail. And all other forms of government must eventually go. While I am loyal to the flag under which we stand, and would countenance no rebel nor any violence, I at the same time declare that in the constitution of this nation, the name of God must be placed and the authority of God must be recognized. 
Beloved, abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace himself sanctify you wholly. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved in fire without flame unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithfully see that all of you, the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, one God abiding you, bless you, and keep you, and all the Israel of God everywhere, forever. Amen. We want you every week to come back and be with us. We want you to know that we're here to bless you. We're here to help change you. We're here to help you make you an end-time warrior that's not afraid of anything, that's ready to invade everything and do what God's called us to do in these last days. Please, when you write, send your prayer request in. Also, you may want to know more information about the Bible school that we have in Southern California. So make sure you say, send me the Bible school information or look it up on the website and have all the information about it. Or if you're in Southern California, you're flying through Los Angeles, we're about an hour south of Los Angeles airport in the city called Irvine. We'd love to have you on a Sunday morning or a Tuesday night, or you can just come any time of the week and come in and visit the Bible school and sit in some of the classes. Also, if you want more information about where I may be speaking, I may be in your area and you may not know it, so make sure you look it up on the website or when you're requesting the tape series here and the special offer with the book, make sure you say, send me Robert's itinerary, or just call and we'll tell you where I'll be and we'll hope to see you there. We hope to see you next week as well too. Have a wonderful day.